So today we are going to go through uh, Reformed Baptist history, the history of the Reformed Baptist movement. Um, it's going to be kind of like a 10 mile up view. We're not, we are going to dial down on some things, but not all things. This is an extensive topic that we could spend months, even years going through, going through the particulars of each person and what they've done and how they contributed to the movement. But suffice it to say, this is going to be an overview. We'll talk about, uh, we're going to go through a timeline starting from uh, the birth and resurrection of Jesus all the way up to the Reformation and onward. Uh, and then we'll go through some more particulars. So just uh, to let you know, can anybody tell me who that is? Spurgeon. I've never seen before in my life. Spurgeon. <laughs> right? And can any, anybody tell me where he's preaching? London. London. Okay, good. More specifically? Is that the Metropolitan Tabernacle? There we go, the Metropolitan Tabernacle. So this ends up being the fruit of the Reformed Baptist movement in England, okay? Specifically, um, the Scotland, yeah, in, in, in England, right? This Tabernacle Fellowship, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, dates back to 1650 when the English Parliament banned independent Christian organizations from meeting together. This congregation braved persecution until 1688 when the Baptists were once again allowed to worship in freedom. Now, as you rightly pointed out, that's Charles Spurgeon, and he ministered there for 38 years. Anybody know who he was preceded by? We might be going through his catechism. Keech. Benjamin Keach. Benjamin. Benjamin Keach preceded uh, Charles Spurgeon. Okay, that's where we get our Baptist catechism. Uh, also, uh, during that time, uh, uh, before Keach, during Keach, and after John Gill was ministering at Metropolitan Tabernacle for 51 years. Now, the original building, which is there, was burned down in 1898, and it was rebuilt again, but destroyed in 1941 um, due, due to a German bombing of London in World War II. In 1957, the, the Temple Tabernacle was rebuilt uh, to a new but much smaller design, and that's right here if you can... If you can see that. Now, I started out with this because this is basically the, I don't want to say the pinnacle of the Reformed Baptist movement, but the pinnacle of it in that area at that time. I mean, we get great men like Benjamin Keish, John Gill, uh, <clears throat> Charles Spurgeon out of this movement. So how did we get here? That's what we're going to go through now. Oh, just a, another little tidbit. This is the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Uh, that's Ireland. Uh, Scotland and England, okay? That's, that's where he was ministering. And just as another point of reference, the Ahmadis. Uh, we support them as a, as a missionary uh, in the, uh, on, the island, on the island of Ireland on the Cooley Peninsula. So that's, that's where they're located. It's a very dark area spiritually, so they do need our prayers. And him and his wife are fully committed. They're renouncing their... Uh, well, actually, yeah, they, they would renounce their American citizenship in order to be citizens of Ireland, to stay there forever. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a heavy, heavy uh, burden. Yes, sir? Just uh, would be remiss if we didn't call out Matthew Brennan as well, who's working in Ireland in a different area. He's in Clonmel. Okay. So if on the map you see where it says Ireland, he's kind of south of there. Okay. But he's he's an actual Irishman local to the area mm -hmm. and, and one of the other few Reformed Baptist people trying to make a movement in that area. Wow. Great. Thank you. I, I didn't even know that, but thank you. So, right. you know, Ireland is, is certainly an area that uh, we're, we're, we're trying to uh, make greater headway with the Reformed Baptist movement. So, okay. So... This is, this is the geographic location, and I just wanted to point out the Amadis for us. So like I said, what I want to do now is just a, a, a timeline. It's not going to be an exhaustive list of events. It's going to be a highlight of some important ones. So obviously we begin, the beginning of Christianity is the, the, the advent of Christ. Now I would contend that even Judaism was Christianity looking forward, okay? So we have in 33 AD Jesus rises uh, from the dead and Christianity begins its movement and starts to spread throughout Rome. In 313, Constantine issues the Edict of Milan, which makes Christianity legal. Now, it's also known as the Edict of Toleration, which uh, at Rome during that time, there was, it was predominantly pagan. So for Christianity to come on the scene and now not just be accepted, but made legal was a big deal. So Constantine helped that, although 
you know, Constantine's uh, theology is probably not one we would, you know, follow. He desired to be baptized at the end of his life so that his sins would be remitted and that kind of stuff. But be that as it may, God, in his providence, used Constantine to make uh, Christianity legal in, in Rome. Uh, in 325, the Nicene Creed is written, and that's the one uh, where Arius was claiming that Jesus was a little God, basically like the Jehovah's Witnesses of today. Uh, this creed, uh, the, council, the council gets together in, in, in Nicaea uh, to debate this, and I think it was 140 uh, ministers to two voted that Jesus is one in essence with the Father, the homoousia, homoousia controversy. But so I just want to give you that little point of reference. Okay, in 520, Irish monasteries begin to flourish. So missionaries got to um, Ireland, started establishing monasteries, monks were there. Uh, later on, they would be sacked by the Vikings, but that there was a, an appearance of Christianity there at that point in time, which will eventually rise up again. In 1054, the Great Schism between the, the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches split. I shouldn't say the Roman Catholic. At that point in time, it was still considered Catholic, which means universal, the universal faith. So there's a split between Catholic, the Catholics and the Orthodox. Basically a split between East and West. That's why we know it as Eastern Orthodox, okay? <clears throat> it was those uh, churches to the East of Rome, okay, that separated. Uh, now Rome uh, and the Catholic Church are, have different understandings of, of Christianity. Uh, Eastern Orthodox is more of a, of a mystical, incarnational, view Roman Catholicism is is a more sacramental uh, and Western mindset view and here we get the first split of the church in 1302 Pope the Pope issues unum sanctum and this, this is kind of like a watershed moment because I'm going to read this to you unum sanctum proclaims papal supremacy Pope Boniface the eighth issued the papal edict unum sanctum on November 18 1302 in a response to a dispute with Philip IV, King of France. The edict asserted that there was neither salvation nor remission of sins for those outside of the Catholic Church. Emphasizing the role of the Pope as the head of the Church, the decree promised excommunication to anyone who rejected his supreme authority, that would be authority over all things political and spiritual. It also articulated that the temporal sword, in other words, the secular authority was to submit to the spiritual sword, the, cler the clergy. So the secular <clears throat> was to submit to the spiritual sword. The edict concluded with the message that submission to the Roman Pope was necessary for salvation. Unum Sanctum marked the height of medieval, medieval papal power. Okay, so this is kind of like a watershed uh, in writing decree that the Pope is head over all things and unless you submit to him and unless the uh, secular authorities submit to him there is no salvation outside of that okay you see what happens in the heart of man when they start to exert this power that they truly don't have and the original Boniface was that uh, Pope Boniface the eighth the eighth, the eighth. and obviously this leads to other issues in the church um, and before we get to Martin Luther, there was Jan Hus, and he, about 100 years, 95 years before uh, Luther started recognizing these things and speaking out about them, and they burned them at the stake. Luther comes along about 100 years later, and that's when this really erupts. This is what we know as the Protestant Reformation, where, where he nails the 95 Thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. Okay, going through the indulgences and purgatory and, you know, justification by faith and all these different things that he protested against the Catholic Church for. Now, the what? The goose and the swan. The goose and the swan, right. Um, he, his, his goal was not to split the church. He was not looking to tear it apart. He was looking to reform it from within and get everybody on board to conform with biblical Christianity. Obviously, we, we know that didn't happen, and here we are today. Okay, uh, 1525, the Anabaptist movement begins. Now, uh, the Anabaptists are basically credo-baptists. They believe in believer's baptism. Uh, they put forth that infant baptism wanted, is, isn't valid, it wasn't valid. So if you were baptized in an inf as an infant, but not as an adult, as a professing Christian, you needed to be baptized again. And the way I remember what an Anabaptist 
is, is that you have to be baptized again and again and again and a Baptist and again and again. All right, real, real quick, I just want to read this to you. Uh, the Anabaptist movement in 1525, often called the Swiss Radicals or the left wing of the Reformation, the Anabaptists separated from Swiss reformer Ulrich Zwingli over the issue of infant baptism. They believed that only those who could understand and publicly, publicly confess their faith should be baptized. The movement, originally called the Swiss Brethren, originated and flourished in Zurich, Switzerland, and then spread to Germany, Moravia, and the Netherlands. The Anabaptist movement began on January 21st, 1525, when Grebel and Manns held their first adult believer's baptism. Persecution quickly followed. Grebel died after being imprisoned in 1526, and the following year Manns was drowned in the Lamont River, the first Protestant martyred by other Protestants. The Anabaptists were predecessors of the Mennonite movement. So here you have infant uh, uh, pedo baptism holders, Presbyterians, persecuting and killing Anabaptists. Credo Baptist, so that's that's an issue too. So our history goes back to those people. All right. In Henry uh, 1534, Henry the Eighth passes the Act of Supremacy, and we're going to get to that a little bit later. I got a, a little blurb to read on that. Uh, the Counter for Reformation begins. Uh, the Council of Trent was written in in 1545, and this was headed up by Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, to counter the teachings of the Reformation. In other words, to get people back to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, this, was, this is where we actually get the, uh, the, I don't even want to call it doctrine, this is where we get Molinism from. Uh, a Jesuit, Louis Molina, started to study what the Reformation taught, and in order to count, counter Calvinism and God's sovereignty, he came up with a system known as Molinism, which, uh, not Molinism, thank you, Molinism. Got the D and the L wrong. Molinism. Uh, we're actually probably going to watch something like that at the at the at the mentoring group this week. So, all right, onward. Thirty nine Articles of Church of England are issued in fifteen sixty three. Now, England was predominantly Catholic. Okay, the uh, the king at the time uh, passed a an edict where thirty nine Articles of the Church of England. Now they're going to separate from the Roman Catholic Church, and these thirty nine Articles are basically a list of their uh, their doctrines, their polity, their church government. So they're separating, and they're known as the Church of England. They're predominantly still Catholic in practice and belief, but they have these articles separating them from the Roman Catholic Church. Well, also, the king then became the head of the church. We're getting there. Oh, okay. We're getting there. Okay. Um, shortly, shortly after that, in 1611, King King James is, is there, King James I, and he issues... Uh, an edict to uh, re retranslate the Bible, and we, that's where we get the King James Bible from. Um, around this time, a little, little bit after the Reformation, Arminius enunciates Arminianism uh, in 1630, and he enunciates that in five points. Most people think that Calvinists were the ones who came up with the five points of Calvinism, uh, but actually they were in response to Arminius's five points of Arminianism. So every point that he issued, Calvinists countered with a, uh, an, an opposing view. That's where we actually get the five points of Calvinism. And finally, in the 1630s, the Clarendon Code was issued. Uh, and this, uh, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into this in a, in a minute or two, but it basically was trying to enforce the Church of England's beliefs on the Presbyterians and the Baptists at that time. It's also uh, shortly before the Westminster Confession was uh, completed and brought forth. Okay, so this is basically the timeline from the beginning of Christianity up until uh, the Reformation. We're going to concentrate uh, probably about from where the 39 Articles of the Church of England are and, until now. Okay, any questions at this point? We're good? Okay, so I told you we were going to get to King Henry, right? He passes the Act of Supremacy, and King Henry of England was a devout Catholic who had received the title Defender of the Faith from Pope Leo. However, in 1529, Henry began an assault on papal control of England in order to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boylan. So now the, the, the Pope wasn't allowing this to happen. So King Henry says, well, I'm going to defy the Pope. I'm going to issue this act of supremacy and do what I want. So it was an act of rebellion. In 1534, the English Parliament passed the act of supremacy. So the people who were in England supported King Henry during this declaring Henry to be the only supreme head on earth of the Church of England, thus placing England outside the Roman Catholic Church's control. In 
Appeals to Rome were forbidden, clergy were forced to submit to the throne, and church assets were appropriated. The Act of Supremacy laid the legal groundwork for the English Reformation. It is also the basis upon which English bishops today are appointed by the sovereign. So the Church of England basically became known as the Anglican Church. The word Anglican is of England. So when somebody says the, the, the Church of England or the Anglican Church, they're talking about the same thing. Anglican means of England. And this is the beginning of the labor pains for the birth of Protestantism in this area. By the end of King Henry's reign, the Church of England was no longer Roman Catholic, no longer in submission to the Pope, which, based on the Unum Sanctum, is outright, defi outright defiance of his, his, his papal bull. But it was also not really, the Church of England was not really Protestant in worship or government. So there was still more work to be done. Uh, later on, King Edward, Henry's son, continued to reform the church, and then it started to become truly Protestant. Uh, King Edward died, uh, and his half-sister Mary became queen. She was, once again, Roman Catholic, so now it's going to start shifting the other way. She died prematurely, Bloody and also... Mary, no. Say again? Bloody Mary. No. Bloody Mary, right. She died prematurely. And then Elizabeth became queen, and she wanted English to the England to become a Protestant nation, and worked hard to get the Anglican Church in line with a more biblically based understanding. So he, oh, I was thinking that the map was behind me. So now you have King Henry in England, okay, uh, defying the Pope's papal bull, and start moving away from them. And now you have King Henry's son who who tried to reform it and get it to be more Protestant. All right, so here, here's the map I was looking for. So this doesn't pertain to Ireland. This is basically pertaining to Scotland and England. Ireland has its own thing going on. In fact, they're, they're still staunchly Roman Catholic. Okay. After decades of contending with Elizabeth and her ministers, Puritans began to yearn for the day when her successor, James VI of Scotland, would come into power. In 1603, he, he did and subsequently became King James I, which we talked about. He brought forth the, the King James Bible. He was raised up as a Calvinist, believe it or not, and a Presbyterian, but demanded conformity to the crown. So he still had an allegiance to the political powers at that time versus a, a separation between the church and the state. Disappointed with James, Puritans began to separate and leave the Church of England and some England altogether. In 1620, some left for the New World on the Mayflower. So now what we're going to do in uh, uh, the next like two or three slides, after two or three slides, we're going to go through a, a, a hierarchy of terms. So when I say uh, Protestant, when I say Puritan, we're going to go through each what each one of those means. Okay, I'm just giving you an overview at this point. England grew worse with James's son, Charles I, pushing an anti-Puritan agenda. Political and religious tensions mounted until England found itself in a civil war. It was during this time that a hundred Puritan ministers and leaders assembled at Westminster Abbey under the direction of Parliament to abolish the Anglican form of government and separate the church and state. Eventually, Charles was tried for treason and beheaded at the hands of Oliver Cromwell, who began to lead England for the next 10 years. So, the Puritans, uh, they wanted an internal change. In other words, a real heartfelt conversion to the faith, not just adherence to external religious ordinances, which is basically what Roman Catholicism looked like. They wanted faith to be a matter of the heart, a way of life, such that when you, when you confessed Christ, your whole life was guided by the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't something that you just talked about. You walked the walk, you talked the talk, and you walked the walk. Okay. Now we're going to get into the hierarchy of terms. So what is a Protestant? A Protestant is those who protested the Roman Catholic Church and its unscriptural practices resulting from the events of the Reformation starting in 1517. So starting from Martin Luther on, we now have a protest of the Roman Catholic Church. In England, with the publication of the 39 Articles of Faith in 1563, the Anglican Church would then officially be considered Protestant. So once they, they issued the 39 Articles um, and King Henry issued the Act of Supremacy, they are now separating themselves completely from the Roman Catholic Church. Unfortunately, it still looked much like the Roman Catholic Church in practice. Now, what's a Puritan? So Puritans were Protestants. 
So it comes out of that category. It's those Protestants who wanted to purify the new church, the Anglican Church of England, from within and not split away from it. Puritans felt the Church of England was still too Catholic and incomplete in its purification. They desired a separation between the church and state as opposed to a monarchy. The Puritans would never settle for what Elizabeth established by a royal decree. The church needed more reforming. In fact, the term Puritan came to denote against pleasure, right? Because the Puritans were all about following the scriptures, and obviously that's going to uh, cause people problems who are in the flesh and desirous to, to live happy lives and, and, and entertaining themselves and feeding their flesh yesterday. Could you just give a little more of an explanation of the difference between the monarchy and then there being this separation between the church and the state? What was the state? What would the state be at that point, rather than the monarch? Okay, the, the, the state was still a, a kingdom with with a king in its head, right. and that's that's what monarchy means. Mono meaning one, arc meaning leader. Right. So there's one leader, and the one leader is over the government and the church at the same time. Right. Now that's a problem. Right? And we're going to see that once the Clarendon Code gets issued. Um, but when you have one leader who's, uh, uh, who's king over uh, the government and the church, now you have a recipe for disaster. Okay? Uh, it's it's the, the Protestants' uh, desire and the Puritans' desire to pull away and separate the two. Not that the two would work independent of one another. They're designed to work together. But the, they they held the belief that a church should be on top of the government. Government should, sub should submit to the church. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, government should submit to the church. Whereas if, if you're the king, and you're king of the government, and you're also king of the, the church, you'd want the church to submit under so you could do whatever you want. Yes, Mike? So that would be against Romans 13. Sure. God is the one who establishes the governments and the leaders and, and that stuff. So that they should fall underneath God's, God's law, God's commandment what God says to do, not what they decide to do. Okay? Make sense? Okay. All right, so now we have separatists, okay? These were Protestants, Puritans, who now wanted to purify the church by separating from the Church of England, which was trying to impose one religion upon the whole of Great Britain. So what they're, the separatists are saying, say, look, <clears throat> we understand you want one one faith over the whole country but we want freedom of worship if we have differences if i want to baptize a, a baby and you want to baptize only adults we want the freedom to do that under the church of england they had one set of rules you couldn't do that so the separatists are the people who want to separate from the church of england and basically follow what they can their conscience in the way they see uh the doctrines of the bible the separatists also did not want a monarchy a king who ruled over both the people and the church. They wanted a separation of power and authority between the two. Again, this gave rise to Presbyterianism and subsequently other doctrinally distinct churches. Right. So at this point, the church is still evolving and it's rooting out false practices and false teachings. Right. Other people, like the Roman Catholic Church, would say uh, the church is becoming contaminated and diluted. It's moving away from truth. We as Protestants see that we're moving away from the, te the false teachings of Roman Catholicism and more in line with the scriptures. Now, obviously, with that, because we're sin-stained people, we're not all going to agree on everything. We agree on the essentials, but the other things we tend to disagree on. Okay. So, Presbyterians. So, so far we had uh, Protestants, Puritans, Separatists, and now Presbyterians. Presbyterians are an assembly of separatists in Parliament during the English Civil War in 1647 who sought to abolish or abolish the Episcopal form of government and authored the Westminster Confession of Faith under Charles I. The Westminster Confession was completed over a five-year period through 1163 meetings by 121 clergymen known as divines, 10 members of the House of Lords and 20 members of the House of Commons who were also members of Parliament a.k.a. the Westminster Assembly, and appointed by Parliament to do so. So this was actually a government dictate to have these men uh, go aside, meet together, and come up with a confession of faith. What does the Bible teach about all these things? So this was within the government. The government told them to do this, and they did. The resulting confession is clearly spelled out 
spelled out the Protestant position on the Christian faith and Christian authority. This was done at Westminster Abbey, adjacent to Parliament in London, hence it received the name Westminster Confession. Right? So it'd be, it'd be like um, a, a people meeting at Congress, and across the street is the Royal Something Hotel, and they meet there, and they hammer out some, some teachings on the Bible, and that becomes the Royal Confession that we, we go forward. With. Yes? Can you clarify what you mean by Episcopal form of government? Uh, Episcopal form of government, um, I, I think that would be... Uh, similar to a pope, there, there'd be a hierarchy of people involved, uh, whereas uh, a, a, a Baptist form of government, uh, we, we hold to autonomy. And I think it would be closely tied to the government. I'm, I'm not exactly sure, Cameron, but that, that, that's... So my understanding is sure. that uh, uh, Episcopal, so when you say form of government, you really mean church government, correct? Yes. Yeah, so an Episcopal form of church government would be basically mirroring... Roman Catholicism, but outside of Roman Catholicism. So you would have priests. I don't know if you would, ha you would have a pope, but you definitely have like bishops who would rule over yes. larger groups of churches and then clergymen at the local level. And so there would be a hierarchy of individuals that mm -hmm. work their way up to some supreme form of, of hierarchical nature, I would think, in the Episcopal mm -hmm. sense. It would be the king of England at the time. Yes, it wouldn't, I, be, it wouldn't be the pope. So right, it would I, be tied to government. But like today, we have Episcopal churches in America, which are essentially they're the Anglican Church, but they can't because they're not in England. Mm -hmm. So if you're Episcopal, <laughs> you're basically an American Anglican, basically. Yes, yes, that, that, that's a, that's a great point. And they would still have priests, right. you know, priests who and bishops and, and bishops, cardinals, cardinals and, and that whole hierarchy. Which again, a, a, a Protestant or Presbyterian would look at that and say. That's not biblical. It's, it's just not biblical. So, but he, he, thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, a, a good movie for you guys to watch if you wanted a little bit more background on this. It's called Cromwell. It's about Oliver Cromwell, and he and it, it's about two and a half hours long. And it, it's it's an older movie, I think in the seventies, but it really helps clarify all these things. You get a better perspective of what was going on at that time. Okay, now we get to the Westminster Confession. Uh, this is the document completed in 1652 by mostly ministers and theologians appointed by Parliament to give a clear statement of doctrine, worship, and church government in order to further reform the Church of England. The official Church of England never adopted the Confession and responded with the Clarendon Code. So the Westminster Assembly comes back, they come, come out with the Westminster Confession. The, the hierarchy of the Church of England, the Anglican Church, doesn't like this. Okay, and this is what they issue, the Clarendon Code. As a result, the Church of England determined to impede the nonconformists and stop their movement. The code included four acts passed in England during the ministry of Edward Hyde, 1st Earl of Clarendon. And here are the four codes. First, the Corporation Act, which forbade public office to those not taking sacraments at a parish church overseen by the Church of England. And basically, what this means is, if you weren't part of the church, the Church of England, you couldn't take part in the government. So in other words, to, to serve uh, in Parliament, uh, in, in the Church of England, you had to be part of the Church of England. If you were Presbyterian, pro, you know, uh, trying to separate, you were not allowed to hold public office. And this is the monarchy, basically government overreach. Next was the Act of Conformity. It made compulsory the common book of prayer, which led to 2,000 ministers resigning. In other words, the government wanted to dictate to the church, the church calendar, the, who the, what the offices are, the rites and sacraments. It wanted to dictate to the church what the doctrine should be. And again, the, the, the ministers, uh, obviously 2,000 have walked away from this. Next was the Covenantal Act of 1664. It made meeting for nonconformist worship illegal, even in private houses where more than four outsiders were present. So what it does, it makes gathering apart from government-sanctioned worship illegal, right? It's made to look like family worship was okay because you couldn't have more than four people, but if you wanted to worship home alone in your house, you could. But once it becomes more than four people, well, that's really like a church. And if, it's, if it is a church, you have to be part of the Church of England. That's illegal. As long as you wear a mask and sit six feet apart. As long as you wear a mask and take the cookies. <laughs> Okay. So you, you, can, you can see how some, some of the things happening today, you know, parallel this. And this is just the heart of humanity 
and, and the overreach and, and men in power trying to go further than what they're supposed to. And then the Five Mile Act, which forbade nonconformist ministers to live or visit within five miles of a town or any other place where they had ministered previously. So basically what they're saying is they didn't want the influence of these men to take root in the communities that they helped build. They had to move away. So if you had a church of 100, 200 people, you had to move at least five miles away from these people so that they wouldn't be influenced by you. So you see how the government, even back then, has animus towards the church, right? Because the church is God's representative here on the earth. So this is what actually pushed, but God uses these things, all things together for good. God uses these things to clarify and further his church on, which we're going to see in a second. The Clarendon Code caused deeper division and essentially ruined any possibility of the Anglican Church of England and the nonconformists working together under one religious and political banner. So they were never going to be able to be meshed together. There was, there was no basic friendship Okay, between the two. Prior to this code and up to this time, civil war was taking place between the monarchy led by Charles I and Parliament led by Oliver Cromwell. Again, you'd be, you, it would be a good idea to watch that movie. It's really going to help put things uh, in order in your mind. And despite these terrible odds, Cromwell defeated the monarchy. His, you know, his, his side, uh, the church, ended up beating the, the government, defeated the monarchy, and had the king beheaded for treason in 1649. And he continued to fight for religious freedom. It was the people, he was the people's choice, Cromwell, and he, or he was offered the crown. He was offered the crown to, to lead England. But he vehemently refused. Cromwell continued to fight for a separation of church and state and later became Lord Protector of England. So Cromwell recognized that if he was to become the king of England, he basically just reverted back to what he was fighting against in the first place. He wanted a separation of church and state. Now, he, uh, he believed that they, they should work together. And again, the government should come under the church's moral authority. Uh, but he refused to become the king because of that reason. He didn't want to go back to a system that had a political head of state who was also the head of the church at the same time. Yes, brother? What is the Lord Protector? Of the Lord Protector is basically another way of saying King of England, the people's choice. So he ended up leading England, but not as the king. Okay, so people, people, people followed him, flocked to him because of his, his stance uh, and the way he, he handled uh, the Civil War and leading the people to, to actually win. They looked to him as the leader. So they were the ones who called him Lord Protector of England. Even though it wasn't an official office, it wasn't a, a true king, he was the leader. Follow? Somebody has to be the leader. He didn't want to be king. Okay. So, nonconformist. I, I use that uh, term. It's also known as the church freemen. It was those Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists that were united together in their common faith who would not submit to the act of conformity, which is part of the Clarendon Code that established the Church of England as the only legally approved church. <laughs> so you have Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and Baptists, and we're gonna learn what Congregationalists in a minute. I know I didn't get to that. Congregationalists, there we go. They held to the Westminster Confession, okay? They held to the doctrinal standard that the divines came to, with the exception of its ecclesiology. They rejected the idea of a presbytery, presbytery or synods overseeing and ruling over the individual congregations and held that individual congregations were independent, autonomous, and responsible directly to God himself. They amended slightly the Westminster Confession at the Savoy Palace in London in 1658 to include their position on church government, and their confession has become known as the Savoy Declaration. Okay, so now here we have the separatists, who, the, the, the Protestants, Presbyterians, who are separatists. Now we're starting to see distinctions between all of them. And the, the, the Savoy Declaration, this was an issue of church government. In other words, they didn't want a hierarchy of government. They wanted people to be able to um, lead their own churches and be held directly responsible to God. It's basically where we are today, yes. 
uh, shortly after this, 1663 is when Thomas Watson wrote the book we're going through in the uh, uh, Amen. It, 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 it's a good point to note that many of the Puritan re writings that were that we learn from and glean from are being written during this period. So it's a period of uh, um, persecution. It's a period of turmoil, trial, and these guys are pouring their hearts out. And as well as it's a time of them digging into the word because now they have to substantiate their positions to the other men in Parliament to say, "Look, this is what we believe." And, and just. To go right along with that, I mean, all this turmoil that's going on, what does he write? All things for good. All things together for good, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Good point. Pastor Anthony. Yes, sir. I think mean, just to kind of expand on that point, I mean, you see a lot of writings coming out of this time because there was so many people really diving into the nuances of their positions. Right. And then now defending it publicly. Mm -hmm. Right. So like all of these Savoy Declaration, Westminster Confessions, and, and ones that will come Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you haven't gotten to. Those are all groups of men getting together who have agreed on these common commonalities in their forms of belief. Yes, and declaring them publicly to everybody that this is what we believe and mm -hmm. why we believe it. So they're needing to dig into the word to defend those beliefs, and the outworking of that is all these less writings that we have. Nehemiah Cox, we've mm -hmm. gone through a number of his books. Mm -hmm. and things. All are from this time period. Yeah, ex excellent, excellent point. Again, this is God's sovereignty and his providence working to clarify his word for his people. Now, again, there's going to be differences between us and Presbyterians and Congregationalists. However, we're united on the gospel, whereas Rome was united around a false gospel, okay, and, and demanded conformity to all of their rules. In, uh, the, the Bible tells us we're supposed to be in unity, not conformity. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we shouldn't seek purity of doctrine and hold the same doctrine, but it recognizes that we're each individuals and each one of us is going to think differently. And God has given everybody different talents, gifts, and abilities. So he wants unity, not conformity. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church and the Church of England are demanding conformity. You have to hold to this or you're not in the, in the true church. We would recognize that the church is the invisible body of Christ, born by the Spirit of God wherever you are. And even though we can have um, some wrong beliefs, we're still united by, by God's Spirit. So there's, there's leniency when it comes to that. All right, in the meantime, the Act of Tolerance. The Toleration Act of 1689 was issued by King William and Queen Mary to ease some of the religious restrictions, but the specific acts under the Clarendon Code were not repealed until the 19th century. So they issue this act of toleration basically to say, all right, we'll appease you Protestants, we'll work at this out, and let's, let's all make nice nice. But it didn't actually work. So here we get to the Baptists. All right, the Baptists agreed with the Westminster Confession and the ecclesiology of the Congregationalists. In other words, we believed in the autonomy of the local church, but we differed on infant baptism. We hold to credo baptism, baptism to those uh, who professed faith in Christ, not as infants. They became known as particular Baptists. And while all this persecution was going on, they met in 1677 under difficult circumstances, persecution from the monarchy, to include the revisions of the Savoy Declaration and further refine the Westminster Confession to reflect their position on believers' baptism. Their confession, although written in 1677, later became known as the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith after the Act of Tolerance was enacted in that same year. So basically they were meeting together underground, okay, after the Savoy Declaration to hone in their position on infant baptism and they didn't come public with it until the Act of Toleration was issued. Once the Act of Toleration was issued, their beliefs would be tolerant, that's when they came public. That's why it was written in 1677 but wasn't made public till 1689. Make sense? That's how we got to where we're at. <clears throat> at the same time, more war would ensue as King Charles' son came into power and he set his sights on reestablishing the monarchy. This led to more religious intolerance and many Puritans fleeing England for America. Great Britain would be divided religiously and politically for another century. Many Puritans of the Presbyterian, Congregationalist, and particular Baptist affiliations fled England for America where they started their own churches. Okay, that's how and why, and, and, and 
Puritans were leaving actually before this, before the act of toleration, but this kind of like put the icing on the cake. More Puritans fled. And us as Reformed Baptists, we're Protestant, Puritan, Separatists, and Nonconformists who differed with Presbyterians and Congregationalists on church polity and infant baptism. Their confession of faith was derived primarily from the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration, finally completed in 1677. This confession wasn't made public until 1689 due to the ongoing religious persecution, but that changed due to the issuing of the Act of Tolerance in 1689, hence the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. So that's how we got all the way up to the London Baptist Confession of Faith. And as they fled England to go to the New World, which is America, they began setting up churches there. So, all right, so this is what it looks like. Originally, there was the Catholic Church, the Church Universal. In 1054, the church split. From Eastern, if East, you had Eastern Orthodox, and then Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. From within the Roman Catholic Church, birthed the Church of England. Okay, England decided to separate from the Catholic Church and start their own church, the Anglican Church. From the Church of England, you have people inside that church who wanted to further reform it. Okay, because it, it still looked too much like uh, Roman Catholicism. Those are known as Protestants. The Protestants birthed the Puritans. The Pur Puritans wanted to purify the Church of England, not just based on church government, but based on doctrine. Okay, they wanted a more pure doctrine and a doctrine that would flow from changed hearts. The Puritans gave birth to separatists, separatists, those who wanted to separate from the Church of England rather than try to reform it from the inside and separate from government control. That led to the Presbyterians being established and they abolished the Episcopal form of government and set up their own hierarchy over the church. That led to the nonconformists who rejected the act of conformity. So all nonconformists were Presbyterians. That leads us to the Congregationalists who rejected the Presbyterian form of government and revised the Westminster into the Savoy. And then we get to the Baptists who looked at the Westminster, looked at the Savoy, rejected infant baptism and uh, unified church government sought autonomy. And it led to the 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith. And that led to Charles Spurgeon and the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And then us. All right. Amen. So there we are. Nice job. Amen. Okay. So I know that was like very fast and a really high overview. I'm not really good at history, as you could probably tell. Uh, but I, I liked looking into this. There's so much more to this. I really think we should probably dive a little bit deeper into it because the particulars are really fascinating to know who stood up for what, why they did it and how they did it. I mean, I think it, it, it uh, behooves us in today's society to recognize that we have to stand. You know, we have to take a stand for certain things, things that are of, of eternal significance. So these guys did it. Our church is still here because of it. The Reformed Baptist movement is still happening throughout America. Uh, Ireland, uh, South America, Cuba, uh, we have Reformed Baptist churches, you know, worldwide. So it's really something that we, we should be uh, happy about, pleased with, to know that the movement is still, is still ongoing. Anyone else?